Hello and welcome everyone to today's 2021 Vincent Rushton Lecture. We acknowledge that we are meeting in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unreceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As we perform our work today, we commit to the work it takes to create a culturally safe, inclusive, and anti-racist culture within our CABF meetings and events. We acknowledge the equality of all communities, and we encourage respect and kindness towards all communities in this meeting and in our daily lives. Today, CABF joins the world in sending our heartfelt thoughts and prayers to the families and friends of the 215 Indigenous children in Kamloops. We pray this horrific tragedy does not repeat itself. Now I have the privilege, on behalf of CABF, to extend warm greetings to our friends across Canada and to everyone everywhere. Welcome and thank you for choosing to be with us. My mom always said, something good comes of everything. And one of the goods from COVID is that CABF has the ability to join friends and friends to be far and wide. Technology is good. Dear friends, member churches and visitors, I want to assure you, you will want to remain with us. You will want to hear our guest speaker, Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis. Dr. Lewis is a chaplain at Acadia Divinity College, and for folks who aren't too familiar with our area, Acadia Divinity College is located in the picturesque Annapolis Valley, which is just about an hour's drive from Halifax. Dr. Lewis will be sharing thoughts on the changing context of ministry in the 21st century. To Dr. Lewis, a warm welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. This Vincent Rushton lecture is a tribute to Reverend Vincent Rushton, who is a longtime supporter and an active participant in the formation of ABF, the Atlantic Baptist Fellowship, out of which has grown this CABF. Reverend Rushton passed away in 1999. However, we believe his spirit remains with us. For your added interest, we have added information about Reverend Rushton in a link at the end of this lecture. I'd like to advise everyone a recording of this lecture will be available within the next day or so on our CABF website and on YouTube. Finally, just before turning the meeting over to others, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone participating in today's meeting. And a special thank you to Reverend Rusty Edwards at First Baptist Church Halifax for his production work on our video. Now, let me turn you over to my colleague, the Reverend Dr. Don Flowers, the Senior Minister of Port Williams Baptist Church for our devotion. In a normal year, I would be welcoming you to Port Williams United Baptist Church for the Rushton Lectures. David and Joyce Allen would be sitting out in the hallway getting your registration, reminding you that your membership to CABF is up for renewal, and it would be easy to do that right now. In a normal year, we would be sitting here in our sanctuary when we weren't wandering around to see friends that we haven't seen since maybe our last annual meeting or maybe the last Russian lectures. We would catch up with family and friends. I would show you the latest pictures of our grandson. We would ask about friends that we don't see how they're doing. Perhaps shocked to hear that they have passed away. I didn't know. I didn't know, we would say. In a normal year, we would be looking forward to a wonderful lunch in Lockwood Hall, the chance to sit and swap stories, to switch, sh share jokes, to laugh together. We would even be looking forward to the short business meeting that would be occurring as much as we ever look forward to a business meeting. But as we know, as we all know, this is anything but a normal year. Last year, we were just learning what a pandemic means as we made the decision to cancel these lectures. But we were certain, we were certain that come October, we would be together in Halifax. And we were, at least virtually. But in June, 
June of this year, we knew, we all knew that everything would be back to some semblance of normalcy. And so we made our plans. We made our plans to be here, at least masked, socially distanced. We would be here. Well, there wouldn't be a meal, but at least, at least we'd be able to, to see each other, to wave across the room to those here with us. And so we made our plans. We made plans for an unusual meeting because even at the very beginning, it was going to be unusual. We are celebrating 50 years of CABF, and that's a big deal. It's something worthy of a party. There was going to be a new hymn, a special pen. Even if not everything to get, we wanted, we were going to be together. We were going to be here. And then came the news. It wasn't unexpected. We had seen the numbers start to climb from 7 to 11, 25 to 50 to... And we knew that there would be steps taken to flatten this wrong way going curve. We have to confess, though, that we really didn't think that it would go on this long, did we? Or this hard. So again this year. Again this year we are separated. I am recording this to you in our sanctuary all alone. You are watching in your home, maybe with just another family member. We are separated by municipalities, by borders. And in such a world as this, it is easy to believe that that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. We are separated from one another. And in that kind of world, it is easy to believe that we are also separated from God. How often has it felt that way in these months when it seemed that our prayers have gone on unheard? We so yearn to be in worship together, to be with our families, to be able to hug our parents, our grandparents, our grandchildren. The separation is so deep, so soul-sucking. It's easy. It has been easy to fall into despair. Maybe that's why Paul felt led to send those words to the church at Rome, to people he had never met. He wanted to go to them, but, but life, life had gotten in the way. And he knew they were feeling cut off, cut off from fellow Christians, cut off from God. And so he wrote those words from Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear that? Can you really hear that? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are the verses. Those are the verses that I turn to when I need some assurance that I haven't been forgotten when I am feeling alone, abandoned, forgotten. Those are the verses I turn to so often as we come to return a loved one to God, to the God who loved them first, to the one who loved us enough to share them with us. We are not forgotten. We are not abandoned. We are not alone. 
I believe those are the words we need to hear, brothers and sisters of CABF. In these days when we continue to be in lockdown, when we're unable to meet in our congregations, that we can't linger for, in the pews for conversations, in these times when we can't hug one another, in these days when even when we are together, we are masked, socially distanced, it's easy to feel alone. Alone like Elijah. You remember his story, don't you? He just had an incredible victory over the, in which the powers of Yahweh had been so dramatically expressed. But then he was threatened, not by a virus, but by a queen. And so he ran away. He ran away and sat down under a broom tree and said, It is enough. It's enough, God, just take me now. God heard his depression. God got him some food, like a good Baptist uh, sacrament of the casserole. And then just asked what was going on. And Elijah just unloaded. I've done all of this for you, God. I've done it all. But I'm the only one left. There's not anyone else around to help me. I'm all alone. During this pandemic, during these days, hasn't it felt like that at times? As we look around and, and see that we're worshiping again all alone on our computers. When even the times that we had looked forward to, the times when we could see our friends from Amherst, from Halifax, Mahone Bay, from Digby, we so won't, we so need, don't we? To need to be reminded that we're not the last Baptist. And yet, here we are. You and me and our computers. In these times, we need to hear the word from God. We need to hear God's word to Elijah. There are so many more. There are so many more we need to know. So many more who still believe in soul freedom, in Bible freedom, church freedom, in the separation of church and state. We need to be reminded that there is a place for us who, to explore big ideas with the larger church and beyond. Ideas that would often seem to be outside the sphere of what good Christians should explore. We need to know that there's a place for those of us who find ourselves living on the inside of the outside of the circle of Baptist Christians. A safe place without fear, judgment, exclusion, or retribution. No matter who you are. We need to hear that. There is a place for you. It might be under a brush tree, it might be on your computer, but there is a place for you. It's a place called CABF, a place where you are not alone. And in this place, in this place, because of the companionship of so many free and faithful Baptists, we can be assured that we are not abandoned, forgotten, separated from God. God is with us, and God will not let us go, ever. Thanks be to God. Amen.
It is a delight and an honor to introduce to you our distinguished uh, Rushton lecturer on this 50th anniversary year of our organization, uh, Dr. Marjorie Lewis. Marjorie is now the university chaplain of Acadia University and also is the dean of the Manning Memorial Chapel. Marjorie arrived on the 1st of March, 2020 which is a significant date, as you well know, in our subsequent history. But she has impressed us by the effective leadership which she has given to the chapel throughout this year. As you know, it's been a difficult year, but it's also, in a way, a pioneering year as well. A pioneering in how to cope with trying to communicate in her own way the message of the gospel and the work of the university chapel. Already she has been appointed the co-chair of the president's uh, anti-racial committee, but she's also a member of other committees in the university as well. An achievement really of someone so new to a university. She comes actually with a profound background in understanding spirituality, university education, and counseling. Born and raised in Jamaica, she was the first woman to become the president of the United Theological College of the West Indies, which is in Kingston. She has also been a lecturer in university education and in spirituality in the West Indies, in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada. Marjorie also was a missionary, a missionary employed by the United Reformed Group in and church in the United Kingdom. There she worked with many other people and she was given an award, a very distinguished award, by the newspaper, The Voice, for all that she had done to help the lives of black people in the United Kingdom. She also was granted a PhD degree in the University of Birmingham. Currently, Marjorie, participates in a number of organizations of interest to us. The Canadian Association for Spiritual Care, the World Council of Churches Reference Group on Human Sexuality, the Pan-African Women's Ecumenical Empowerment Network, the Jamaican Council of Interfaith Fellowship, and the Caribbean Women Theologians for Transformation. But today, we especially welcome her to the Canadian Association for Baptist Freedoms. And we are glad to have her as our lecturer this anniversary year. We are thankful for her gifts of thought and creativity, which she brings to us as she settles into Woolful and becomes one of us. So I'm very glad to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Marjorie Lewis, as our Rushton lecture for this year, as she comes and becomes a part of us. Well, thanks to uh, Roger for that um, very fulsome introduction. Thanks to the Canadian Association for Baptist Freedoms and the organizing committee for the Rushton lecture for this invitation to present this lecture. 
Um, it really is an honor to be asked and a joy to have this opportunity to converse with you. I too want to start by acknowledging that I'm in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and to thank the Mi'kmaq people for their hospitality to me these five plus years that I've been in Nova Scotia. As we contemplate the discovery of the bodies of 215 indigenous children and the announcement only this morning, as, as far as I heard it, that a search will, searches will also be undertaken in Nova Scotia and I think other sites across the USA and Canada. I want us to just honor this grief. And in honoring the grief, I offer this lament from Matthew chapter two, verse eight in solidarity with indigenous peoples who mourn and in memory of the children who suffered and who were not given a proper burial. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children she refused to be consoled because they are no more. And so with that lamentation in mind, we move to consider the topic the changing context of ministry in the 21st century. As I wrestled with the question, I wondered in what sense really is the context of ministry changing? I ask you to have a look at the slide that's before you now and uh, invite you as we go through the lecture to converse also with the images. Is the context changing or is the context remaining the same? Image sources are from the World Council of Churches, um, their work to prevent climate change, and also the logo for the next General Assembly of the World Council of Churches. So on the one hand, it could be argued that there are significant changes in progress now, for example, due to climate change. For just over a year, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has dominated our attention. The global pandemic seems to have pushed the pause button on life as we knew it and resulted in a dramatic apocalypse, an uncovering of realities, some less palatable than others. The pandemic seems to have shaken many out of places of certainty and the complacency. One writer described it in this way. The COVID-19 challenge is unprecedented. It has caused enormous trauma, disrupted economies, social life, mass transportation, work and unemployment, supply chains, leisure, sports, international relations, academic programs, literally everything. Churches and religious communities have not been spared they have been severely affected and in all likelihood permanently transformed by the pandemic. The pre-COVID-19 world is gone, replaced by a new normal. The new landscape calls for both resilience and adaptation, embracing new ways of doing things and of being church. Churches have to adapt. They have to ask themselves questions about the implications for being church 
in this new normal context. So here, um, this is one perspective by one theologian. On the other hand, to quote the famous saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. I won't massacre it in French because my French is non-existent. Canada has in fact known pandemics before. In ancient times, there were outbreaks of plague, cholera, influenza for argument's sake, and in more modern times, HIV and SARS preceded this new experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whether during a pandemic or outside of times of pandemics and crises, I would argue that there are consistent struggles brought on by the ambitions of powerful nations and the inequalities among people. Age-old existential questions seem to be part of the human condition and to be with us from the past through the present and seem set to journey with us, with all humanity into the future. So here there are two contrasting images. Um, one of Dermot McCullough and his BBC documentary series, which I recommend. I have no, um, no brief from McCullough, but if you're interested in church history, it's nice to gallop through the history of the church in six one hour BBC documentaries. The other is representative of my own theological perspective. This is Nani of the Maroons, who is the only national heroine in Jamaica and one of Jamaica's freedom fighters. So my own perspective, theological perspective, is what I call Nani's theology, which is a Jamaican contextualized version of womanist theology. What does it mean to do theology from the perspective of being Black, woman, Christian, and Jamaican? In this journey by Dermot McCullough, McCullough, sorry, um, there was an interesting scene I found, an interesting experience of, of, of this journey through 2000 years of church history. In this series, McCullough explored eras and themes like first century Christianity, Catholicism, the rise of Rome, orthodoxy, um, 16th century revolution, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, Protestantism, the evangelical explosion, recent Christianity, and post questions about where the church goes next. It was interesting to me that McCullough maintained a dispassionate academic tone throughout and only disclosed his perspective right at the very end. Spoiler alert. He disclosed that he was what he calls a candid friend of Christianity, a gay man descended from three generations of Anglican priests. He concluded that many changes had taken place since his father was priest. In fact, a woman priest was at the time this documentary was recorded, now in charge of the congregation formerly served by his late father. Human sexuality was on the table. Ideas of Christendom had been replaced in Europe and skepticism and doubt, in his view, dogged Western Christianity. He, however, ended with an optimistic note. He noted the developments of Pentecostalism and the thriving church in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And his judgment was that Christianity has, over the centuries, proven to be resilient. McCullough's disclosure at the end signified the importance of one's perspective on how one grapples with issues such as the changing context of ministry in the 21st century. As a Black heterosexual clergywoman, now in, um, in Nova Scotia, and I refuse to call myself a come from away, I've adopted this phrase someone else used, I choose to be here. My perspective is shaped by the experience of being from the global south and an ethnic minority in the Canadian context. My view of Christianity is colored by the history of the collusion of the Western church in baptizing enslavement and the absence of the unearned 
privilege uh, uh, um, and the business of the honor and privilege of being white. I don't share that privilege. I therefore offer you thoughts from my standpoint and experience and invite us and invite you to respond to the issues from your standpoint and experience. I'm persuaded that the ancient Judeo-Christian tradition of various schools of theology being in conversation does lead to a space where the Holy Spirit provides deeper understanding and greater illumination than the sum of our individual expressions of insight. So in wrestling with the question, in what sense is the context of ministry changing? I concluded that there was both change and continuity. And so I share with you this image of God as mother. The specifics of the context and occurrences will change as long as there is life. And change can be significant. The changes call followers of Jesus to constantly ask the mystics question. What is the point of Mary giving birth to Jesus? If I do not give birth to Jesus in my day and time. While it may be possible and may be actually beguiling to be able to find passages of scripture to use as prescriptions for every new situation that arises, this is not always the case, nor I would submit has it ever been the case. New specifics arrive. For example, the matter of faithful partnerships between same-sex couples. In conversation with McCullough in the documentary mentioned previously, the Dean of St. Martin's in the Fields Cathedral pointed out that there was actually no text that can be easily plucked out of the Bible with a definitive pronouncement attributed to Jesus on this matter. The Dean noted rather that the church has to wrestle with principles of faith and to apply these principles to present problems and in my words, to be content to operate without a prescription. A significant change that occurred um, last year was the murder of George Floyd and the global response against racism and in particular anti-black racism seemed an unprecedented outpouring certainly for many of us in our lifetime. Others had been killed previously by the police in the United States, but this murder of George Floyd seemed to be a Kairos, a particularly special moment of global proportions. The George Floyd murder was perhaps the single most dramatic apocalyptic moment during the pandemic's first year. It uncovered just who were among the marginalized and the disenfranchised in the society. The list was significant, but the pandemic highlighted these disadvantaged members of our society, the women, the poor, the black people, the indigenous people, the migrants all over the world these were among the, the people most severely, severely affected by the pandemic because of structural inequalities that existed long before the pandemic. So there was some change and in some ways a kairos with the murder of George Floyd just over a year ago. But as I mentioned earlier, in some ways things have not changed. The antics of empires outlined in the biblical literature, Persia, Babylon, Assyria, Rome, Egypt, seem remarkable, similar, remarkably similar to the power games of the 20th and 21st century empires, um, perhaps the shorthand for which is the G7 countries. The power of rich nations and powerful leaders to manipulate and oppress those that are weaker and the ability of the church to collude with the powerful 
is a theme that continues into the 21st century. The acts of resistance by the marginalized and their allies in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, campaigns in the USA to counter voter suppression, and many, including churches demanding that the rich make vaccines available to the poor, demonstrates that the battle for good continues. This image is from a publication um, from the World Council of Churches entitled Walking Together, Theological Reflections on the Ecumenical Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. In the Revelation, the Apocalypse, the book of the Revelation and all the other names, the battle between good and evil is unveiled with metaphors that certainly are contest contested by feminists and other theologians. The new Jerusalem coming down from out of heaven from God, the good virgin bride adorned for her husband, which we read of in chapter 21 and verse two. Contrasting images of whores, the whore of Babylon, meaning many scholars feel Rome, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abom abominations and the impurities of fornication and another bad, bad woman. The rival prophetess, Styla Jezebel, in chapter two, verses 20 to 23, who refuses to repent of her fornication. Then another image, the mother clothed with the son, giving birth to the uh, Messiah, chased and ultimately rescued along with her child from the dragon who awaited the birth of the child in order to devour the child. Then the sage paints the image of purity, 144,000 men who have not defiled themselves with women. While the metaphors are useful, and indeed, the book of the Revelation has been a book that has been really important for some Black theologians and people who find themselves suffering. The male-centered perspectives that are embedded in this book of uncovering, of suffering, and of the promise of hope, these male-centered perspectives are not just issues for the first century. These metaphors around women, around Black people and so on, really need to be considered by us as we move into ministry and mission in the 21st century. I won't go more deeply into that, but I leave that for us to discuss in some, perhaps to tease out as we converse after this. Apart from the concerns around these stereotypes and stereotypical images of good women and bad women, there is also, I submit, the stark contrast of stereotypes around who is good and who is evil. I would suggest that life does not always see good and evil residing as clearly defined opposites in um, discrete personalities. The truth is that as followers of Jesus the Christ, we often have to wrestle with the ethical questions that recognize that we as individuals and the church as an institution doesn't always do the good that we want to do. Um, and sometimes we fail to do the bad. Sorry, we don't always do the good that we want to do and we find ourselves doing the bad that we don't want to do even with the best of intentions. And even those good intentions um, we find sometimes can be damaging to others. In grappling with what changes and what remains the same in the 21st century, I propose a few steps in seeking to be faithful co-workers in God's mission. And I'm going to be good and use um, 
the number seven, which is part of our heritage as Christians. Um, I have to apologize for some sounds you're hearing. Um, I'm getting some things coming in that I'm gonna to try to see if I can um, eliminate. Okay, so here we are with seven quick points that I offer for, for our discussion. Firstly, history needs to be revisited. This documentary by McCullough could be one place to start. Um, as I said, a quick gallop through the centuries of Christian history and specifically the history of the church. But I would urge us to hear as many perspectives of history as possible to allow for wider space for the, the Holy Spirit to illuminate us all. There's a West African saying that warns, if lions do not have a historian, Tales of hunting will always favor the hunter. Here in Canada, we need to ask whose stories are being told. The Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission calls to action and the United Nations report on the decade for people of African descent are two documents that I would recommend as companions in our consideration of the history of the church um, in Canada. A 2016 team from the United Nations came to Canada at the invitation of the Canadian government and conducted an audit on the state of Black Canadians. I want to quote a section of the historical overview of this document, which I hope will inspire you to um, further research and action. The document says in part, Slavery existed in Canada from the 16th century until its abolition in 1834. After slavery was abolished, African Canadians still had to, had to contend with de facto segregation in housing, schooling, and employment, and exclusion from public places such as theaters and restaurants. African Canadians made significant contributions to early Canadian society. In the War of 1812, African Canadians fought in the British Army, defending Canadian borders against the United States. Similarly, in 1837, African Canadians assisted in quashing the rebellion in Upper Canada against the proposed unification of Upper and Lower Canada by the British. The contribution of African Canadians was also notable in politics. Not only did they contribute to bringing the, the province of British Columbia into the, con into the Canada Confederation, but they established successful settlements and founded schools that provided education for children of all races. In the 1960s, the African Nova Scotian community of Africville, north of Halifax, was destroyed to make way for industrial development. For over 150 years, Africville had been home to hundreds of African Canadian individuals and families, some of whom could trace their roots in Nova Scotia back to the late 1700s. Africville was a vibrant, self-sustaining community that thrived despite the harshest opposition and most of its inhabitants were landowners. The denial of services, environmental racism, and a targeted pollution of the community and other deplorable tactics employed by the authorities to displace the residents of Africville is a dark period in Nova Scotian history. I encourage you, as I said, to do some more reading on this matter. Perhaps a reflection on the history of people in the society and the church could be a good conversation to have. A conversation of this nature may ask people of various ethnic groups to tell their own stories. What does it mean to be black, to be indigenous, to be Asian at a time when racist hate crimes are happening? What does it mean to be white and to assume an anti-racist commitment at this time? Secondly, 
And this is the, the unpaid advertisement for the Manning Memorial Chapel. In Black History Month this year, the chapel hosted a conversation on Black perspectives in ethics. And it's online, so do um, check it out if you're interested. In this conversation, academics from Acadia University and guests grappled with the topic. The continuation of white privilege in the academy, the silencing of the information about achievements of Black in intellectuals, and the continued unethical treatment of Black and Indigenous people in the healthcare system were among this, the ethical issues laid bare. The truth is that Canada has work to do to insist on ethical treatment of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, racial, racialized minorities in this place. How do we have conversations about ethics? Not just about right and wrong, but the complexities of the good and the better, the bad and the worst choices. How do we cultivate in leadership and membership of the church the type of curiosity that genuinely seeks to know those who are not in the immediate circle of family, friend, congregation, or culture? How does the church cultivate ethical thinking and action for this day and age? Historical and contemporary examples provide us with signs of God re God's reign in the Johannine sense of signs. Anti-slavery campaigners, both black and white, were present in the society and in the church to end enslavement. The confessing church in Germany resisted the Nazi theology and worked actively to save many who were marked for extermination by Hitler. Even today, climate justice activists and others are campaigning, working, and praying for an end to poverty, discrimination, degradation of the environment, and the denial of human rights. Okay, our slide has one of the two images it would have, but this image that you are seeing is from the Toronto Kairos blanket exercise. And again, I invite you to think about that image, to think about um, the words that are right across that image of um, of Canada. Our history isn't boring when we tell the truth, it says. So um, I move on to the third suggestion as to how we may approach um, mission in the 21st century. As Don Flowers said in, in his very um, moving theological reflection at the beginning of this, uh, our time together, we do have some opportunities here in the midst of the problems of the pandemic. And perhaps thirdly, there is a call for us as we think about moving in mission in the 21st century to embrace relevant models of church through which to express mission. What is the church if we can't physically gather together? Many have, of us have been grappling with this. In journal articles, podcasts, Zoom seminars, friendly con conversations, the past year has put the, mat the matter of the nature of the church squarely on the table. Of course, there are obvious changes, for example, the way in which churches were suddenly called to communicate virtually. We are reminded by one writer that this is not a new question. Historically, notions of the invisible church and the visible church have been discussed. For example, this writer noted that Calvin speaks of the church as the ecclesia, the called out people of God, 
in terms of the visible and invisible church and describes the visible church as the quote, external means or aid by which God invites us into the society of Christ and holds us therein. And so I would encourage us as we continue to think about models of church to not neglect the historical conversations and the historical perspectives, not only by John Calvin, but by many others within the various traditions of the church. Fourthly, the closure of churches because of um, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in many innovations in liturgy and pastoral care. And I would like to suggest that chaplaincy is an area of ministry which would benefit from intentional attention by, um, by the church at this time. Having been exposed to hospital chaplaincy and university chaplaincy in Canada and Nova Scotia especially, I can't help but notice the trend in the reduction of funding um, and the termination of posts uh, of chaplains by both the church and the states and the state. Post-secondary education is a time that is pivotal for many in deciding on their life's occupation in forming families. It is a time of intellectual inquiry and openness to exploring meaning, purpose, and values to inform adult decisions, the nurturing of children, and to decide whether or not to contribute to the society at what I would argue is the peak of physical and intellectual functioning. Yet from fellow university chaplains, there are stories of downsizing, of people being laid off. Some hospitals are currently replacing positions previously held by chaplains with social workers. Some churches have renew, reduced the number of chaplains they employ. In 2017, the province of Saskatchewan, as part of their um, budget cutting exercise, axed all the hospital chaplains in the province. The, cha the main chaplains re re remaining now are Roman Catholic chaplains. Traditionally, the church has provided key support and rituals for significant moments through the life cycle. Moments such as birth, Christian initiation, marriage, and death. The ministry of the church has helped people grapple with the extent existential issues of life at moments when these reverses are most keenly felt. Sickness, imprisonment, natural disasters, redundancy, and so on. I would like to suggest that a concentrated focus on chaplaincies would help the church to actively join in God's mission in diverse places and at these key moments in people's lives. For mission in the changing context of the 20, 21st century, I suggest that chaplaincies should be high on the agenda. Um, let's go to the next slide, please, Rusty. The fifth suggestion I would make for our consideration has to do with spiritual care. Back in the day, as the young people would say, when I was being trained in the 1970s in the basics of pastoral care and counseling. I was told that pastoral care had four functions. We could reel this off by rote, healing, guiding, sustaining, and reconciling. But there has been new thinking since the early ideas of the 20th century. One of the, the significant persons in my view is Professor Emmanuel Larty, a black pastoral theologian from Ghana who worked at the University of Birmingham and at Emory University in the United States. Larty noted that in addition to the classic four that I mentioned, um, theologian Howard Kleinbell suggested that nurturing should be added 
and Larty's own contribution was the importance of adding liberating and empowering to the basic functions of pastoral care. He was speaking as a black person and looking at the ways in which black people, whether on the continent or in the diaspora, um, had to cope with the reality of racism. For Larty, pastoral care can't simply be in the Western model of one pastoral caregiver speaking to one client only about issues related to that person and their psychological functioning. But that pastoral care has to expand, according to Larty, out of that space to challenging the structures in the society and the ways in which the environment seeks to oppress and marginalize people. The growing focus on competences for spiritual care and not simply pastoral care within a confined Christian context is a development that has been important in clinical pastoral education and other disciplines. In these spaces, it is understood that pastors and religious leaders should now seek to, to, to be equipped to provide spiritual care, not only to people in the particular space in which um, the pastor has, has allegiance, but also to provide care for people of any or of no religion. I think this speaks to the matter of relevance. Um, in this identified trend, which certainly I have observed in Canada. There is a growth that has been noted statistically in the numbers of those who identify as spiritual and not religious. And perhaps this changing context is providing not only a cause for lament about falling numbers in congregations, but opportunities that we can latch onto as we participate in God's mission. These may be ways in which, so there may be ways in which we do not always have to have getting a church member in, bombs on pews as the only objective of our ministry and our mission. Although I don't see anything wrong with um, seeking to bring people in if that is sensitively done. A former spiritual advisor once told me, God is in that person's life before you meet them and will be in their life after you're gone. She urged me to be open to provide spiritual care for persons, even with those whom I meet temporarily, as well as those with whom I would have a more extended relationship as a spiritual companion. Many are now in need of persons who will listen without judgment and without a predetermined agenda, save the honoring of the story that they are being told. Stories are being told by communities also, and our attention to these stories could be key to mission in the 21st century. Paul in Athens walked around, looked, listened to understand the community. He was able to learn that people were religious and believed in the unknown God and was able to find a way into conversation using that knowledge. What do we hear from the people we see? The conversations um, that are noted in person or on social media. Whose voice is present and whose voice isn't represented in the conversations? What are the literal and metaphorical languages spoken and how do we converse with people in those languages? Some years ago at the Atlantic School of Theology, a seminar was held on the role of qualitative research in ministerial formation. A book was subsequently published coming out of that conference. The consensus in this, in this gathering was that qualitative research was an important skill for those being trained for ministry, as it provides a tool and as a skill set to listen, to understand people and communities, and a skill set that complements the spiritual care and counseling skills in the curriculum. COVID-19 has placed on the agenda 
the matter of equipping not just the clergy, but also the laity to be trained in the basics of ministry and mission, of listening, of offering spiritual care. Many clergy were unable to reach parishioners, and it is the laity who were nurses, cleaners, doctors, um, and so on, who were present with patients when neither clergy or family could go in. The priesthood of all believers, I submit, needs to have more teeth in our exercise of ministry and mission for the 21st century. And so finally, I share with you another image of someone else trying to work through what this 21st um, ministry mean. It's, it's something called imagination, courage, and resilience. And I think if you look closely, it looks like the mushroom cloud of a nuclear explosion. And it is not, um, it's not something that it is that is incidental, because this is a logo um, from um, a World Council of Churches statement on US presidential executive order protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States and its impact on refugees. And it also speaks to the work of um, a scholar who has been working with the, United, with the um, World Council of Churches and the United Nations to challenge um, the issues around nuclear weapons. And so I want to make a brief um, mention here of the sixth point, which has to do with mental health care. I'm coming to the end. Trauma-informed care is all the buzz now in the healthcare system. The pandemic has led to this unveiling, as previously mentioned, of those who are disadvantaged. And as it turns out, those who do not have uh, affordable and easily accessible um, mental health care. There are those who have been especially affected during the pandemic because of loneliness, the inability to be with loved ones, people who could not go to work or school to get respite from abuse within the home. Those, the extra stress placed on women who are mothers and caregivers and have had to give up work or try to juggle work, um, being a parent and being a teacher to children who had to be learning at home. Visible minorities, young people, LGBTQ2 spirit and, and um, plus persons, uh, people of color, black people, indigenous people, the poor. Mental health issues have disproportionately affected those who were already marginalized and uh, suffering within the society. Important work has been done by sociologists and psychologists, especially res with respect to the North American experience of intergenerational trauma with both black and indigenous persons and others. I briefly mention two academics of interest. One is Joy DeGruy from the United States. The other is Ingrid Waldron from um, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Joy DeGruy came up with an idea and uh, this notion of post-traumatic slave syndrome. For DeGruy, this is a phenomenon where en formerly enslaved people and descendants of formerly enslaved people in the Americas developed certain ways of surviving the experiences of trauma such as lynching and have passed on these um, coping mechanisms down through the generations. For DeGruy, some of the ad adaptations made during enslavement need to be changed and are no longer serving the mental health and the social functioning of black people in North America. But there are also helpful strategies for resilience which need to be retained within the black community. Degree calling on evidence from photographs and other primary source material 
posited that this history also resulted in a process of desensitization of white populations in the Americas and a resulting diminished ability of white people to experience empathy for the suffering of black people and other people of color. Now, whether one agrees with Joy Degree or not, I think her ideas are worth examining. One important um, piece of evidence that she put on the table um, to support her claim has to do with the photographs and other information which showed white families, including children, in their Sunday best, leaving worship services in churches to attend the entertainment of the lynching of Black people. Women, men, and children watched these lynchings dressed in their Sunday best. And often afterwards, there was competition to take body parts as souvenirs. She asked, how can children be exposed to this without these children being socialized into a diminished capacity of, for empathy with respect to those who are being lynched? Her work is not only in publications, but there are a number of um, videos and lectures that are readily available online. The second scholar is Ingrid Waldron and hot off the press yesterday, she um, circulated the result of research that she has done entitled um, Black Mental Health Professionals Speak, informing the Nova Scotia Health Authority's African Nova Scotian Healthcare Strategy. I won't go into that except to say um, we have copies of that report which we can make available. And so one question is, what will happen post COVID with respect to mental health care? What will the churches do? What have we learned during the pandemic about what we may want to keep and what we may need to change about the ways in which we do mission and ministry in the 21st century? Finally, I want to talk about resources, filthy Luca. An explanation that I have often been given for why we can't have chaplains, why we can't do this, why we can't do that, is we don't have any money. My question is, well, what do we have? Metaphorically, we have five barley loaves and two small fish. I share with you three examples, two from Jamaica and one from Nova Scotia, not as prescriptions, but as encouragement for us all to think creatively, or as one song puts it, to color outside the lines as we seek to find, to identify and deploy the resources to do uh, ministry and mission in the 21st century. So briefly, here's the first example. Dr. Joel Allen from Jamaica, in what was my home congregation growing up, along with other members of the church. He's an investment banker and academic and a consultant now in finance. Um, looked at what was happening. The church, the congregation wanted a fancy new building on top of the hill, but they were not making the money fast enough. To summarize it, they came up with this idea, which was feasible because they had an investment banker as a member of the congregation to raise the capital needed to complete that building by um, posting a private bond issue. They actually did put up two private bond issues. They raised the capital um, based on, on money loaned to the church by the members. The building is up and the money is repaid. So that's one. What can the Holy Spirit do when we are all gathered together, when we are all of one heart and mind, when we do not claim any of our possessions, resources, talents, or gifts as our own, but we share everything that we have? The second Jamaican experience is the Mission Enterprise Company. United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands had um, some... Um, commercial enterprises, 
Some were successful, some were not. For various reasons, the um, uh, mainly business people in the church looked at the situation and said to the executive council, you know, there's a better way of doing this. Why don't we consolidate all of these enterprises into one mission enterprise with the denomination as the sole um, shareholder and get a properly trained business person to run this mission enterprise with a view to making all of these entities financially viable and able to contribute money to the mission of the church. Um, again, we can discuss this in detail. There was quite a debate in the Synod. I was present where the first, it was tabled and um, the biggest part of the debate was around ethics, which I found interesting. Um, how does the church do business ethically? That mission enterprise has been um, established, is registered, is a company and is up and running. The third example I will give is in Nova Scotia. And this is um, the work of our good friend, the Reverend Dr. Roger Prentice. Um, in the 1990s, um, when Roger was the um, chaplain of Acadia, he had the foresight to set up an endowment fund for the Manning Memorial Chapel. It has given the chaplaincy at Acadia much needed financial stability. Um, and uh, we can talk some more about that. But of course, you know, you're not going to get away without a little advertisement from me. So I in invite you, if you are not yet contributing, to the endowment fund of the Manning Memorial Chapel to let you know it's up and running. And we certainly, the team at the chapel, we hope to continue this and to build on the work that was done before. Um, to probably take um, a quotation of scripture out of context, Paul sows, Apollos waters, and God grants the increase. So friends, I encourage us to be in one heart and one mind and to find creative ways to share our possessions. In this changing context for ministry in the 21st century, as we had as our theme, I asked the question, what has changed and what hasn't changed? Details of the culture change, technology and climate change as two examples. What remains the same? existential questions of power dynamics between the mighty and those who are lowly. God's power to create and continue to create and to call us to be co-creators on the journey to the full expression of the reign of God. And therefore, we claim the resilience and the hope that is our birthright as individuals and as church. We do not fear but we exercise the faith of an Easter people. Thank you.